But if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Isaiah chapter six. We'll have the notes on the screen behind me. We've also got them on our FC app. If you haven't downloaded our app, it's a great way to stay up to date with what's going on, to browse our connect groups. Um, You can give online. You can uh, go watch previous sermon series and you can follow along with our current uh, sermon. So we're gonna be in Isaiah chapter six, reading the first five verses and it says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, and each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke, and I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of unclean or people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for your word. God, thanking you for the fact that we're able to be here and just getting a chance to to grow in fellowship with one another and grow in grace and knowledge with you. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts to receive, open up our ears to hear what you would have for us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are in our last week of our series, The Little Things, talking about these little things that have a big impact on our lives and the lives of the people around us. And I want you guys to do something. It's gonna be something, it's really small, really little, really short, um, and we're gonna do this as an exercise together. And, and I just need you guys to trust me on this, okay? So I want you to close your eyes for 10 seconds. I'll count. So everyone go ahead and close your eyes. Now let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, 10, you can open your eyes. Super easy, right? Didn't have to move in your chair, didn't have to like adjust, you're just able to close your eyes. If your person sitting next to you is asleep, just go ahead and be like, hey, the 10 seconds is up, bro, let's let's go. Um, Super easy, 10 seconds, not that long. Most of us can hold our breath for 10 seconds, we can endure a lot for 10 seconds, am I right? Pretty small, not that big of a deal. Now, if I were to ask you to do this exact same thing as you're driving down 71st Street at like 5 p.m., might have some different results. It'd be a a pretty big impact on your life and the lives of the people around you. Um, I don't know about you, but have anyone ever tried to drive with your eyes closed? Like, I'm like, I'm scared, right? I do it for like a little bit. Anyone, am I the only psycho in this room? All right, cool. Um, Don't do it, it's not not recommended, don't don't do it. Um, But the thing is that little things have a big impact. If I were to ask you a little question or a seemingly little question, like how would you describe God or what's your view of God? We'd probably get a whole lot of different answers in this room. A room of this size, there'd probably be a lot, there probably wouldn't be one consensus answer. Hopefully, I'm pretty optimistic that most of those answers would be rooted somewhere in scripture, right? That you're not just making something up, um, you know, that, that you have a basis, you're right? Maybe we would say something like, God is love. That's a popular one. God is my father. God is our provider. God is peace. All rooted in the scriptures, all good answers. But what if I were to tell you there is one description of God that encompasses all of those attributes. That one, one word that all those attributes are filtered through. And that we've gotta have this view of God first and foremost. And it's the word that, is read, that we found in Isaiah chapter six, when the angels are crying back and forth to one another and they're describing God, not as God is love, 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 or father, 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 but they say what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, there's a couple ways when we talk about this word holy, there's a couple of different ways that, that we can think about it. And, and one way that, that is common to like us is we talk about living holy lives. We talk about like our righteousness, right? our, our character, um, living different lives. When we're talking about God being holy, the way that we're, we're thinking about it today is, is him being separate, him being other, him being unlike anything we could ever experience on this earth or anywhere that we go, that nothing compares to his majesty, his character, or his glory. And this is what we mean when we talk about God being holy. And now there's two times where we see this description of God, one in Isaiah chapter six and one in Revelation chapter four, where Isaiah gets this this vision of the throne room of God and he hears God described as holy, holy, holy. And we see John in Revelation chapter four get a glimpse of the throne room of God and the same chant is happening, holy, holy, holy. We've got to view God as holy above all else. It's the only description in the Bible that is emphasized not just once, not just twice, but three times, that nowhere else in the Bible is a characteristic and attribute of God described in this way. 
And now as we, we read through the Bible, whenever we see words repeated, and we should pay attention as we're reading you know, through our Bible anyway, but as we see these words repeated, we should perk up and pay attention. And Jesus did this in his teaching, particularly in, in the book of John, where Jesus, when he, when he wants his readers to really pay attention, when he wants to grab their, their focus, he says two words. He says, truly, truly. And this word truly is where we get this word amen. Right? Now he's saying this is this is something you need to understand. This is something that is vital. This is something that you need to pick up on. He says, truly, truly. And then he gives this statement. And so when we read God as being holy, 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 our, our, our ears should perk up. Our, our eyes should focus in because it's the only characteristic of God that's, that's um, described to the third degree. And some of you may be like, Michael, what's, what's the big deal? Like my view of God was found in the Bible. My view of God, like God is love. That's in, that's in the Bible, absolutely. And God is my provider, absolutely. It's found in the Bible. But here's the deal. You would have a difficult time convincing me that someone can have too high a view of God. I don't think there's such a thing. But I think it's pretty common for us to have too low a view of God. And what happens is if we don't understand as, as, as God being holy above all else, there's this wiggle room that comes into play when we're called to be holy. Because if God being holy isn't a priority or on the top of our list, then us living holy lives is not going to be a priority either. It doesn't mean that we're not excited to come to church or we don't engage in worship, but it, but it means that we fail to understand who it is we're worshiping or who it is that we're reading about as we've turned the pages of the Bible. And so what, what I wanna do in these next 20 minutes or so is talk about this holiness of God. It's this impossible task. There's no way that I can adequately cover it all in 20 minutes, but I, but I hope it helps us in our understanding of God, which in turn helps us live different lives as we walk out of here. And so when we talk about the holiness of God, one of the first things that comes to mind, one of the first things I wanna talk about is the holiness of God should amaze us. The holiness of God should amaze us. We look at Psalm chapter 33, verse eight. And it says this, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. If we remember the, the passage that I read in Isaiah, you see this incredible description of God that his voice is, is shaking the foundations of the temple, that smoke is filling it, that the whole earth is filled with his glory. And you have these superhuman angelic beings going back and forth and shouting, covering their face, covering their feet and shouting that God is holy. Man, this amazing picture of God. Man, I, I use the word amazing probably more than I should. Um, I use the word awesome probably more than I should. You know, I, I see a movie, and that movie was amazing, that pizza was awesome, when really I could just use words like that pizza was delicious or that movie was really good. You know, because the definition of amazing is extremely impressive. Or sorry, sorry, that's, the definition of awesome is extremely impressive, daunting, inspiring admiration, apprehension, or fear. The definition of amazing is to be greatly surprised or to be filled with astonishment, wonder, shock, bewilderment. My son is really into the Super Mario movie right now. And the first time I saw it, I was like, it's a great movie. Doesn't seem to be really any hidden agendas in there, like just fun, great movie for him to watch. You know what? It starts to lose its luster whenever you watch it for 4,000 times. He's like, Bowser? I'm like, yep, Bowser, peaches, 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 right? It's like, okay, dude, I get it. He's like, Mario. I'm like, it's -a me, Mario, right? It starts to lose some of the sheen after a while. But I still describe it. It's an amazing movie. That pizza's awesome. Really, is it awesome? Is it an awesome piece of pizza? Do you eat it and then contemplate like all the choices that led you up to this point in life? Are you like, oh, what's happening? Are you falling out of your chair? You're like, oh, don't eat it. It's too precious for human consumption. Like, is this what we're doing with our pizza? No. We finish it because we're Americans and we're not quitters, right? <laughs> Never would have beat the British if we were quitters. No, we, that, it's, not, it's not an awesome piece of pizza. It's delicious. It's good. It's terrible for you, but who cares, right? Um, but we use these words too often and they start to lose their meaning. Psalm 99, verses two and three. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he, we miss the fact that we get to come in here each and every week and worship the God who created the universe. That, that we get to read God's holy word, his word which he revealed himself to us. Like we, we, we lose that fact. And I think the reason of that, so the reason for that is because we've confused awe with entertainment. We, we, we think that we need to be 
entertained, that, that, that our eyes have stopped focusing on the things above and we've started focusing on the things of this world and we start to see all that the world has to offer and forget that we are serving a holy and totally separate and unique God. Why do we do this? Because we have unlimited entertainment at our fingertips. I was, I was running errands yesterday with my son and he was wanting to listen to songs Man, when I was listening to songs, like when I was growing up, I had to wait for the radio to play the song that I wanted to listen to. Or I had to go buy the CD. I'm like, Spotify, you want to listen to this song? Wheels on the bus. Here we go, kid. Let's go. All right, just whatever. I, I, could, I could watch whatever movie I want to watch. We see movies with $100 million budgets. We go to concerts like the Taylor Swift concert, which is drawing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to this concert. And we see this incredible show. It's a great show. And we come back, we're like, man, if church was something like that, it would be so easy for my lost friends to come to. And we've brought God down to saying, if God could mimic what we see here on earth, that would do the trick. And we've confused awe with entertainment. If we were to come in here today and have a worship set with just us singing, no lights, no lyrics, no music, we'd probably leave and be like, that was different. I hope they get it figured out for next week because it's Friends Day and it's a big day. So I hope whatever technical (laughs) issues we're going on, they get it figured out. Can I tell you that God doesn't need our help in being awesome? That there's nothing I can do, there's nothing our media team can do, there's nothing Pastor Justin can do to add to who God is. But for many of us, we look for the extras to decide whether that was a great service instead of saying, man, am I just amazed at who God is? Am I just amazed? I'm not knocking what we do here at all because I think we want to bring, our, uh, bring excellence because God deserves it, right? God doesn't deserve our, our leftovers, but he deserves our very best. And so we bring him our very best. But if we're not careful, we gauge a service, we gauge an experience based on what we get out of it instead of just being amazed at who God is. I want you to listen to what Moses wrote Moses, who never got to sit in a service like this, right? If we were to sit in a service that Moses was at, we got to go to the temple that Moses got to go to, or the tabernacle, for those of you that are like, hey, the temple wasn't built yet, calm down. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but if we went to that service, you might be like, oh, this was kind of boring. It's kind of weird. It's kind of off. You know what Moses wrote about God in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11? Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Man, what happens is when we have this low view of God, just like the movies that we eat, or the movies that we watch, the food that we eat, the, 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 the coolness, the awesomeness of it starts to wear off after time. When we have a low view of God, our amazement starts to wear down. I've grown up in church my entire life. Anytime the doors were open, man, I was there. Sunday school, went to, went to youth group, went to Bible college. I can tell you the stories. Man, he parted the Red Sea. He, he shut the mouths of the lions, right? He saved me. He, he made the, the, the lame to walk and the blind to see. He did all these really cool stuff, cool, awesome things. And the amazement and the wonder has worn off. Why? Because my view of God has been too low. And I'm no longer amazed at his presence, no longer amazed at his works, no longer amazed at his faithfulness. Some of you are like, well, Michael, I've been a Christian for 50 years. I'm past that. Cool. I'm I'm past that. Cool. Show me in the Bible where someone ever got used to the presence of God. And I'll give you that point. Man, the holiness of God, the presence of God should never cease to amaze us. And if our view of God is too low, it will. It will. Holiness of God should amaze us. The holy, and the second thing is this, the holiness of God should break us. I want you to listen to what Isaiah says in chapter six. After he's experienced this, he's experienced the presence of God. He's seeing this amazing scene and he says this. He says, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, Isaiah wasn't just some dude off the street. He wasn't some scrub. 
Isaiah was a prophet. That means he was entrusted with bringing the word of God to the people of Israel. That's a pretty high task, pretty high responsibility. God saw something in Isaiah that said, hey, out of all the people in the nation, I'm calling you to do this. Yet when Isaiah steps into the presence of God, he's not like, hey, cool, I'm here, what's up? No, he gives out this cry of despair and says, I'm broken, I'm undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips. But Isaiah, you're, you're God's prophet. Bro, like, chill out, calm down. No, 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 you don't understand that when I'm in the presence of God, that on my best day, my good deeds are like filthy rags. That I can offer nothing to God. And he's, he's broken at the sight of this. Some of you guys are, Michael, that's Old Testament. I'm in the New Testament. Come on, somebody. Woo, amen, right? That's like what you're thinking. Well, let's read some verses out of the New Testament then. Matthew chapter 17, verses one through five. We're gonna go through, through four or five here. So hang out with me for a second. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses, Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Let's go to Luke chapter two, verses eight and nine. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were what? Filled with Fear, Mark chapter four, verses 38 through 31. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. He then said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's turn to Revelation chapter one real quick talking about John um, seeing the, the vision of, of uh, the exalted Christ in verse, uh, Revelation chapter one, verse 16 and 17. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. That when these men of the New Testament experienced the presence of God, it broke them as well. Look at Peter who was crucified, who was imprisoned, who was tortured for his faith, holding strong through all of that. But when he experiences Christ, what's he do? He breaks, falls at his face, terrified. James, the first disciple who was, who was executed, who was martyred, beheaded, holds strong to his faith, breaks in the presence of God. John, boiled in oil, when that didn't kill him, he was uh, uh, banished to an island um, by himself. And when he experienced the presence of God, Breaks twice, doesn't get used to it. Peter in Luke chapter five, professional fisherman, been fishing all night, hasn't caught anything. He's loading up his nets, just is like, man, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills, I don't know how I'm gonna feed my family, I, don't, I didn't catch any fish to feed my family. Jesus steps in the boat and says, hey, cast your, let's, let's push off and, and, and cast, cast your down the other side. Peter's probably thinking, man, I've been doing this all night. If you say so, fine. Whatever, what's it gonna hurt? Throws his net over the side of the boat. And as he's pulling in this haul of fish, the nets begin to break and his boat begins to sink because there are so many fish in the nets. And when he sees this, he doesn't think, hey Jesus, I got a great idea. You and me, once a month, buddy, buddy, partnership. <laughs> like 70, 30? Jesus is like 50, 50, bro, right? This doesn't happen. He's not like high fives all around. No, 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 you know what he does? He says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Why is this? Because God is holy. He is separate. He is other. He is unique. 
and, and our brains have this computing power that whenever we see someone, like I'm seeing some of you nod your head, I'm like, okay, they're with me. I'm some of you like this, I'm like, they might not like me, right? I'm seeing this right now, and my brain's computing this even as I'm speaking. And you see this, you see people come at you and they're waving and they're happy, and you're like, they're my friend, they're, they're, we're on good terms, right? They wanna talk to me. You see someone come at you and they're angry and their fists are bald, they're, that person might wanna fight me, I'm gonna stay away from them. That we have this way to process and, and, and understand what it is that we're experiencing with one another. But when these people experience Christ, there is no, nothing in their brain that's able to capture what they're experiencing. And, and, and their default is just to fall terrified, broken in the presence of God. I like what John Calvin said. He said, we are never made so aware of how low we are until we stand in contrast of how holy God is. Even the strongest among us, people that think they're the best, it doesn't matter how strong you think you are, how much you can endure here on this earth. When we are in the presence of God, it breaks us. If you've ever been a follower of Christ, you, you probably experience this weird dynamic where there's this simultaneous um, amazement and awe of who God is. But as we seek after God and as we get into his presence, there are these precious moments where, where we're just so overcome that we just break. Maybe it's, it's quiet reflection. Maybe you fall on your face. Maybe, maybe you, you begin to weep, whatever it is, but there's this weird dynamic where we're in awe, but then we're, we're broken in the presence of God because we understand how destructive and ugly our sin is in the sight of a perfect and holy God. Some of us don't like the word break because in our minds, something's broken, can't be fixed, we toss it out, throw it away. We're confusing break with being hurt or damaged. Can I tell you that the world and our flesh and sin is what does the hurting and damaging? But God's in the business of breaking. He's in the business of breaking. You're like, I don't like that. God sent his son to this earth, lived a perfect life. His body was broken so that we could be made whole. Before Jesus was crucified, he, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is what? Broken for you. That Jesus was broken so that broken humanity could be restored into a right relationship with him. We've got to understand this. We've got to realize that it's, it's not until we're broken by God that we can be put back together. R.C. Sproul says, when the one who himself is holy, who is different, touches what is ordinary, it becomes extraordinary. And that when God reaches down, breaks us, we're able to be put back together to something that's used for his purpose and for his glory. And we're able to live out this verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Here's why this little view of God, this little, little, little shift in how we view God makes a big difference. Because when we view God as holy above all else, we're claiming that he is different, that he is special, that he is extraordinary, that he is exalted. And guess what? Now we're called to be holy. We're called to live different lives. We're called to be walking testimonies to the character of God. And this is where the second meaning of holiness, this personal righteousness comes into play. We're able to, to reflect the character of God to a lost and dying world. But if you don't view God as holy, Man, then reflecting his character and all our conduct, it's probably not a priority. And we let slip these, these little sins. And it's no harm, no foul. No harm, no foul. Not a big deal, just a little sin. No one saw, didn't affect anyone, it's okay. Isaiah broke. The prophet of God broke. Why? Because I'm a sinful man. He saw God as holy, holy, holy. And we've got to understand this whole sermon series, this is what it's been about. I mean, you look at week one, the words that we use. It's not just using words to make each other feel better, but we're using holy words that we're encouraging and building up one another, that we're living a righteous life in our words that we speak and the way we use our finances, that we're using them in a holy way, a righteous way that glorifies God, that we're, that, like we look at week three, the people that we surround ourselves with, that we're not compromising 
but we're holding true to what God has called us to do. We look at last week and being able to extend forgiveness, that we're living these righteous lives, these little things that are reflecting the character of God to a broken world. And we're able to do this, why? Because we've been broken by God. But thank God that he has come down, chosen to adopt us into his family, has restored us, has redeemed us, has put us back together, and has sealed us and imparted us with what? The Holy Spirit. A different spirit. Why? So we can live different lives to a broken world. This is our call as Christians. And this is why viewing God as holy above all else is vital. Because if we don't, if it's an afterthought, then reflecting the character of God's an afterthought. That's not what the world needs. Man, the world needs to see God lived through us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. God, and we thank you. God, we thank you that you have reached down. God, in our brokenness, in our hurt, God, and you put us back together. God, that you sent Christ to die on the cross so that our broken lives could be restored and lived out for you. God, and I pray that as we leave here, God, that our view of you is shifted just a little bit. God, that while you are still love, God, you love with the holy love. While you are still our father, you are our holy father. God, that, that it is your uniqueness. God, you're separating us. God, that, that puts us in awe and amazement. God, that we look past all the extras and we just look to you. God, help us fall in love with you again. God, help us be amazed by you again. God, and let us be broken again. We don't get used to it. We don't grow familiar with it. But you continue to do a work in us. 